The majestic ocean has been the home to many great vessels, but none have made such an impact as the legendary RMS Olympic. This colossal ship was one of three in the White Star Line's Olympic class trio and a feat of engineering that proclaimed her unsinkable. From her maiden voyage in 1911 to her retirement in 1935, this grand leviathan served as a pivotal symbol of British power at sea. So what is its legacy? Across its remarkable career in naval service, the Olympic faced its share of challenges. From the Hawk collision that damaged the ship's hull to multiple engine room fires, this leviathan of an ocean liner was put to the test. How did it fare? What stories will be told about this great vessel? Was it truly unsinkable? Stay with us and find out. The RMS Olympic was a flagship of the three Olympic class ships operated by the White Star Line and registered in the United Kingdom. Compared to her equally famous but much shorter lived sisters, the Titanic and the Britannic, Olympic's career lasted from 1911 to 1935. Service included duty as a troop ship during the First World War, which won her the nickname Old Reliable. After the war, she returned to civilian service and operated as an ocean liner throughout the 1920s and in the first part of the 1930s. Growing competition and a drop in business during the Great Depression after 1930 made her operation more unprofitable. Until the German SS Imperator entered service in June of 1913, the Olympic was the biggest ocean liner in the world twice during the years 1910 and 1930. This record was only broken by the short reign of the slightly bigger Titanic, which had the same dimensions but greater weight. The Olympic remained the biggest British-built liner until the RMS Queen Mary was constructed in 1934. White Star Line, a British shipping firm, had a fleet of 29 steamers and tenders in 1912. The three Olympic-class ships were the biggest boats ever constructed for the business. White Star Line chairman J. Bruce Ismay and American banker J. Pierpont Morgan discussed the three ships in the middle of 1907. Morgan ran the International Mercantile Marine Company, which owned the White Star Line. White Star Line competitors included Cunard Line, its new faster passenger ships, the Lusitania and Mauritania, and the German shipping companies Hamburg America and Norddeutsche Lloyd. Ismay also advocated commissioning a new class of liners that would be greater than anything that had come before and would be the epitome of comfort and luxury. The firm wanted to replace the RMS Teutonic and the RMS Majestic, its two biggest and most outdated ships from 1890, in part as a reaction to the largest Cunarders. Olympic took the place of Majestic and Titanic replaced the latter. But after the loss of Titanic, White Star re-established the Majestic in her previous position on the New York route. These vessels were built by Harland and Wolfe, a Belfast-based shipyard whose partnership with the White Star Line dates back to 1867. Harland and Wolfe were allowed a lot of freedom to design ships for the White Star Line, and the company often worked with the shipbuilders in a friendly manner. Harland would take a broad idea from the White Star Line and transform it into a ship design. For the first two Olympic-class vessels, a price of $3 million was agreed upon, with extras to contract, and a standard 5% charge added on top. Olympic-class ships were designed by Harland & Wolfe's in-house team of architects and naval architects Lord Pirrie, a director of both Harland & Wolfe and the White Star Line, oversaw the endeavour, along with naval architect Thomas Andrews, managing director of Harland & Wolfe's design department Edward Wilding, was Andrews' deputy and the man in charge of the ship's design, stability and trim calculations and Andrew Carlyle was the shipyard's chief draftsman and general manager. Carlyle was responsible for all of the finishing touches, the furnishings and the overall layout. This included the installation of a well-designed lifeboat and davit. Harland and Wolfe gave the blueprints to Bruce Ismay and other White Star Line management on July the 29th, 1908. A design accepted by Ismay in three letters of agreement signed by him two days later gave the green light to begin building. The first ship, which would eventually become the Olympic, was initially unnamed and simply referred to as Number 400 because it was Harland and Wolfe's 400th invention. The Titanic was a reworked version of the same plan, thus the same number was assigned to it as well. Thomas Henry Ismay, Bruce's father, originally intended to construct a ship named Olympic as a sister ship to Oceanic. But when the elder Ismay passed away in 1899, the ship's construction was halted. To reduce stress on the shipyard, the construction of the Olympic started three months before the Titanic. It would take some time before Britannic could be introduced to the world. Harland and Wolfe remodeled their Belfast shipyard to suit the class's construction, with the most noticeable modification being the consolidation of three slipways into two bigger ones. Without being named, the Olympic was launched on October 20, 1910. It was common practice at the time for the first ship of a new class to have its hull painted a light grey colour in preparation for its launch, 
making the ship's lines more visible in black and white photographs. Following custom, the White Star Line never named any of its boats, and the hull was painted in a light grey for the launch. The three propellers on the Olympic made it different from the others. Each of the two side propellers had three blades and was powered by a triple expansion engine. The centre propeller had four blades and was powered by a turbine that utilised steam that was otherwise leaked from the triple expansion engines. Career Olympic sea trials began on May 29, 1911, after her completion, during which her manoeuvrability, compass and wireless telegraphy were evaluated. She finished her sea trial successfully. Olympic then left Belfast and headed for Liverpool in 1911. As a publicity stunt, the White Star Line planned the launch of its inaugural journey to coincide with the launch of Titanic. After her open to the public day in Liverpool, Olympic travelled to Southampton on June the 3rd to be prepared for her first trip. The ship's crew and the journalists were thrilled to see her arrive. The deep water port at Southampton, then known as the White Star Dock, had been exclusively designed to handle the new Olympic class ships and had opened in 1911. Starting off from Southampton on June 14, 1911, her inaugural trip made stops in Cherbourg and Queenstown before arriving in New York on June the 21st. The inaugural trip was commanded by Edward Smith, who would die the following year in the Titanic catastrophe. Thomas Andrews, the ship's designer and other engineers from Bruce Ismay and Harland and Wolfe's Guarantee Group were on board for both the outbound and inbound trips to New York. Sadly, Andrews would also perish in the sinking of the Titanic. As the biggest ship in the world and the first in a new class of superliners, the Olympics maiden trip received enormous international interest from the press and public. Upon her arrival in New York, Olympic was opened up to the public and attracted over 8,000 visitors. At the New York Harbour, more than 10,000 people showed up to see her go on the first voyage back home. During her third voyage, she had a Cunard Line observer on board looking for inspiration for the Aquitania. The Hawk Collision Olympic had her first major accident on her sixth trip, on September 20, 1911, when she collided with the British cruiser HMS Hawk. The two vessels were travelling parallel across the Solent when they collided. The commander of Hawk was caught off guard by Olympic's huge turning radius when she swung to starboard and he could not take adequate evasive measures. Hawk's bow, built to ram ships and cause them to sink, connected with Olympic's starboard side near the stern, creating two huge holes in Olympic's hull, above and below the waterline and causing flooding in two watertight compartments and twisting the propeller shaft. Regardless of such a close call, Olympic made it back to Southampton under her own power with no casualties or major injuries to her crew. HMS Hawk's bow was severely damaged and she almost turned over. After this, she was repaired but destroyed by the German U-boat SMU-9 in October 1914. At the time of the accident, Captain Edward Smith was in charge of the Olympic. A stewardess named Violet Jessup and a stoker named Arthur John Priest were the only two crew members to survive the collision with Hawk and the sinking of the Titanic. The Royal Navy blamed Olympic for the event, saying that the ship's huge displacement created a vacuum that sucked Hawk through her side during the investigation that followed. While Olympic was normally under the authority of the harbour pilot, the White Star Line was still hit with huge legal expenses and the cost of repairing the ship, and the fact that she couldn't be used for revenue service also didn't help things. However, Olympic's survival after such a devastating collision seemed to validate the construction of the Olympic-class liners and strengthened their unsinkable image. Olympic was repaired to a point where she could sail back to Belfast for more extensive work, which took little over six weeks to complete. Harland and Wolfe had to postpone the construction of the Titanic by using a part from the broken propeller shaft of the Titanic to speed up the repair process. On the 20th of November 1911, Olympic returned to duty, but on the 24th of February 1912, she experienced another setback when a propeller blade broke off during an eastbound journey from New York. Titanic's first trip was originally scheduled for 20th of March 1912, but was again pushed back three weeks so that Harland and Wolfe could get her back into service as quickly as possible. Naval Service White Star Line had planned to hold Olympic up at Belfast until the war was finished once she returned to Britain, but in May 1915, the Navy requisitioned her and the Cunard ships Mauritania and Aquitania for duty as troop transports. At first, the Navy hesitated to utilise enormous ocean liners as troop transports because of their susceptibility to enemy assault, but they had to use them due to a lack of available ships. The unfinished sister ship Britannic was now requisitioned for use as a hospital ship. While serving in that capacity on November 21, 1916, she sunk in the Aegean Sea after hitting a German naval mine. Olympic, which could carry as many as 6,000 soldiers, was stripped of her peacetime luxuries and equipped with 12-pounders and 4.7-inch cannons to become a warship. 
On September the 24th, 1915, HMT 2810, newly named and now commanded by Bertram Fox Hayes, sailed from Liverpool with 6,000 men bound for Mudros, Greece, and the Gallipoli campaign. On October the 1st, a U-boat sank the French ship Provincia near Cape Matapan. Olympic spotted her lifeboats and rescued 34 people. The British Navy criticised Hayes for this, saying he had placed the ship at risk by stopping her in an area where hostile U-boats were present. While a massive ship anchored would have been an easy target for U-boats, fortunately the ship's speed was seen as her greatest defence. Before the Gallipoli campaign was called off in early 1916, Olympic made many trips with troops to the Mediterranean. There was some thought in 1916 of using Olympic to sell soldiers to India around the Cape of Good Hope. After further inspection, however, it was determined that the ship was unfit for this job because her coal bunkers, built for transatlantic voyages, were insufficient for such a lengthy voyage at a reasonable speed. Instead, the Canadian government hired Olympic in 1916 and 1917 to bring soldiers from Halifax, Nova Scotia, to Britain. In 1917, she was outfitted with 6-inch cannons and painted with a dazzle camouflage design to make it harder for onlookers to determine her speed and course. Her dazzling hues included shades of brown, blue and white. Her repeated trips to and from Pier 2 in Halifax Harbour, bringing Canadian soldiers to and from Europe, then returning home after the war, made her an iconic city symbol. In Halifax, she posed for many paintings by the famous group of seven artists. The Olympic Gardens, a huge dance venue, was also named after her. Once America went to war with Germany in 1917, Olympic sent thousands of American soldiers to Britain. Retirement As time passed, Olympic began to show signs of age, becoming more costly to maintain. It was decided in 1935 to permanently put the ship out of service, and she was eventually sold. The deconstruction of Olympic took a long time. The vessel was transported to the English port of Jarrow on the Tyne River, where shipbreakers T.W. Ward Limited dismantled her. Taking out the ship's furniture and appliances was the first step. This included everything, from the main staircase to the ship's engines. Some items were sold to museums and collectors, while others were melted down for metal. When the items were taken off, the shipbreakers got to work and demolished the vessel. For this, the ship had to be disassembled into smaller pieces before being taken apart individually. Deconstructing Olympic was a laborious operation that lasted several years. Despite this, shipbreakers salvaged many of the vessel's original components successfully. More than 600 tons of steel were sold for scrap, along with other metals, including copper and brass. The ship was one of the finest ocean liners ever built, and she had an important role in the Great War and the history of maritime travel. Those who had sailed on her, worked on her, or even just admired her from afar, shared a sense of loss after her retirement. The RMS Olympic was a remarkable vessel that will forever be remembered in maritime history. It's easy to see why the RMS Olympic is considered one of the best ships ever constructed, with its remarkable design and engineering, as well as her historic maiden voyage. Its immensity and splendour overshadowed an age of unparalleled wealth and invention, and yet the same ship had the courage to withstand the stormiest seas. While the ship itself has been lost to time, many of her belongings may be found in museums and private collections across the globe. Her legacy, however, continues, and she is still regarded as one of the great liners of her day.